Before we move on to implementation of inversion algorithms for the radon transform, uh, let me make some final remarks on sampling and band limitation. The first one is uh, one that I actually forgot. And uh, I've showed you several uh, signals, band-limited versions of signals of uh, the signal of uh, the unit interval or the delta distribution. But uh, the question is, um, we're, of course, interested in images. So what does that mean for images? And uh, in fact, it means exactly the same thing. I leave a program for you to play with. And uh, uh, in this example, we start off with uh, the modified Shep Logan phantom. So this is something that's supposed to look something like a human head. And uh, this is the original. So this is the image that we start with. And uh, now we take the Fourier transform, and that's the centered Fourier transform, centered 2D centered Fourier transform, as I already defined it. So uh, the frequencies around zero are in the center. So here, there's, that's where the big values are. And uh, the um, small values, the high frequencies, are around the edges. Now, um, what does that mean, this uh, spatial Fourier transform? What does uh, band limitation mean for that? Well, only a small portion of the Fourier transform coefficients around zero are left. So let me take a band limit of 10, which means that uh, only um, of the, I think it was something like 128 Fourier, uh, 256 Fourier coefficients in each direction, excuse me. And uh, I leave only 10 of these. So uh, um, I the band. This is the band limited. The Fourier transform of the band limited version. I leave only the Fourier coefficients in this small rectangle over here. So uh, that's where the norm of uh, the of norm of xi, where we evaluate the Fourier transform, is smaller than ten. And uh, I take the inverse Fourier transform of this, and this is what comes out. And uh, it's no surprise, it's uh, much smoother than the original image. So that's in a way exactly what we saw with signals. And uh, if you look at it, the, there are still, still some details uh, which are quite nice. So uh, the big ellipses over here are still visible in a way. Of course, the small, uh, um, um, the small details completely went away. Uh, the outer skull over here is somehow still visible, so that's nice again. Uh, and if you look at it closely, then you'll find that this looks very much like the results of the first computerized tomograph that uh, was um, built in the 50s, 60s, 60s, end of 60s. And um, so uh, that means that the Fourier transform, the, the um, um, values of the Fourier transform that uh, could be measured with that old one were very few. So uh, um, the, uh, the image is bad because only very few Fourier coefficients could actually be measured. OK, now if I raise the band limit, if I choose omega larger, then more a larger portion of the Fourier transform is left. And uh, I take the inverse Fourier transform. It looks something like this. And you see now you um, have the, the ellipses are now clearly visible. Also, the circle up here, which was a little bit murky up here, uh, is now visible. Uh, the small details are still invisible over here. Uh, so the resolution of the image is not yet big in, is, is not yet small enough to uh, represent these small details. But I would like to point out something. You see these rings over here. They're actually, they're, they seem to be copies of that ellipse over here. 
And uh, this is something which is known in medical tomography as ringing. As you see there are rings around the center, which you see here. And um, in fact, that's uh, due to the Gibbs effect uh, that we looked at when we, uh, that we al already had when we looked at signals. There was an overshoot uh, 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 along edges. And uh, so if you come out from, out from the outside to the inside here, then uh, you see that there's a wave uh, going up and down here, and that's exactly the, uh, the consequence of this large um, discontinuity over here, which represents the skull. So that's exactly the same thing that we already saw in the signal, uh, for the signals. Now, if I take the band limit even larger, then um, I get an even clearer image. Now, here's the, the other resolution is good enough to represent the small details down here. You can actually separate the small details. So uh, yeah, the resolution is larger uh, than these tumors down here. Uh, but you see that you do not get rid of the ringing. So this this, these, these waves are still visible, so that has to be dealt with in a different way, and we'll see how that is done. Okay, so uh, that was that, and uh, of, as usual, you will get the programs to play around with these and hopefully get a good understanding of how that works. Uh, next thing, um, I want to tell you something about sound, and this is really something uh, about the sampling theorem. Uh, we already learned that uh, only frequency uh, frequencies can only be um, represented reliably if the sampling uh, rate of uh, um, of a signal is double the maximum frequency. So uh, that also applies to sound and um, a human he ear can hear. Um, frequencies roughly in the range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So uh, that means in order to represent uh, the all the frequencies that a human ear can hear, we have to have a, um, a sample rate of at least 40 kilohertz. Now, uh, that's not all that's to the story. Uh, if you read, um, for example, the articles in Wikipedia, I think they're a bit, little bit misleading because uh, what actually happens when you record, a, a, when you correctly record an audio signal is um, you have an analog filter on the input side, which caps all frequencies that come in at uh, 22 kilohertz so it annihilates all frequencies coming in from the from the from the outside to the microphone at 22 kilohertz and uh, it leaves everything a bit, uh, under 20 kilohertz intact so uh, um, the analog filter makes sure that everything in the range up to 20 kilohertz is represented correctly and beyond 22 kilohertz everything is not, uh, annihilated so there are no frequencies in that signal beyond 22 kilohertz um okay um so um now um a sampling rate of 44 kilohertz is used so um, that is um, 44 kilohertz is double 22 kilohertz. So we can represent now all correctly all frequencies in the signal that comes in up to 22 kilohertz. So definitely we will be able to correctly represent the all frequencies below 20 kilohertz. And uh, so that's uh, that's that's what uh, that's what we want. And uh, so uh, the minimum rate, the minimum sampling rate that we need to um, to correctly represent uh, um, something that the human ear can hear is 44 kilohertz, and that's exactly what is used. Okay, um, why do we have that analog filter? Well, there's one important thing which is uh, which in the articles that I read was um, quite often missed. Um, it's not important what you want to measure or what you want to record, but it's important what is in the signal. 
So if you remember uh, the error term that we had in the Poisson summation formula, um, there was on the right hand side there was that uh, there was that um, that error term, and uh, that was only zero if the uh, if the signal we look at is correctly. Uh, band limited. So it's not sufficient that we say, okay, we only want to reconstruct um, um, frequencies up to 20 kilo. We only want to measure frequencies up to 20 kilohertz. But if there are higher frequencies in the signal, then they will contribute to my error term and they will actually um, falsify the uh, low frequencies that I really want to measure. Right. So first of all, I need to uh, I need to cut off everything beyond a certain limit using an analog filter, and then I can digitally sample, and that's what usually happens when you take a record in. Okay. Um, now uh, this is um, yeah um, just to uh, to give you an idea of uh, why that is. Um, this is, I think, that's sine of 10 times x or something. Yeah, that's uh, the sine of uh, 10 times x. So it looks something like this. And it has been sampled with an enormously high, far too high sampling rate. So that's why we can see sine of 10, uh, uh, 10 times x here quite nicely. Okay, now let's take an extremely uh, small sampling rate and let's take, I think uh, there was five sample points on zero to pi. Uh, to, to pi. Uh, no, I can, I don't know how I can, I want to make this a little bit larger, uh, a little bit better. So uh, I take only five samples. So same same function again. It's sine times uh, a sine of ten times x. But I take only five sample points, and uh, what comes out then is I sample here, 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 and here. And you see what happens. This doesn't look like sine of ten times x. It looks exactly like the sine of x. So um, if I reconstruct my signal from this, then it would exactly look like sine of x and sine of 10 times x would incorrectly be um, interpreted as, as sine of x. So taking the sample rate too low uh, will not only miss the high frequencies, it will actually uh, falsify also the small frequencies because the large frequencies will be incorrectly assigned. And this is something we already saw. Okay, uh, now here's something that uh, you might want to play with. I find it uh, very nice. Um, we take uh, a, um, a simple signal. So it's the sign of, I think, uh, let me, yeah, 444 uh, times T. So that's uh, Kama Tona. And um, we sample that and play it. And uh, so um, let me show how that works. I hope you heard it. So uh, this is Kamatona. And that's OK, because uh, the frequency of Kamatona is 444 hertz. And my sample rate was 1,200. So um, the minimum rate would be 888. So that's OK. So the uh, sound should even not change if I take it as something like 890. So let's hope. I'm not completely sure. I, I think I didn't try this. Yeah, the sound doesn't change, right? I hope so. Um, I have no perfect, um, perfect ears, but um, 890 is perfectly OK. Let's go to 850. And uh, now the sample rate is too low. It should be 888. Uh, now I have 850, and it should be represented as a different tone. So let's try this. Uh, I'm not convinced. So maybe that was just too low to actually hear it. Try again with something that's a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Now, now we can definitely hear it, 
right? So 888 is uh, is needed and uh, 800 is far too low. So we get the wrong frequency and uh, the sample rate is too low to get the uh, to, uh, to get the original um, signal back. By the way, um, what I did here is I used the reconstruction formula from uh, Shannon's theorem to get back to the original function and resample it in such a way that um, um, the audio device that I have can actually play it. That was um, that was a problem. So, uh, but um, I used the formula here, and so everything's fine. Okay, um, let's try this in a little bit different way. Uh, so this time I have two sounds. So one sound at 444 and I think one at uh, 600 something. So uh, let's go away again. Um, I have a sample, sample rate of 2000. That's enough. So um, I should be able to correctly reproduce my signal. So. So that's now my signal, two beeps, two, uh, two pure sine waves. Um, now I take this to 1000 and I think that already um, uh, that's already too high for one of the two. So 888 is, is correct for the lower one, but the other one has some 600 something. So this should now no longer work and we, we should not hear the original definitely changed. The sample rate was too low. Uh, and obviously the higher tone was reconstructed in a lower frequency. So that's again what I told you before. If we have a um, high frequency that is not covered by our sampling rate, then this distorts, this falsifies the low frequencies as well. Okay, uh, let's go a little bit higher. I think we can go up to 2,100, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, that's roughly the tone we started with. So that is uh, what we need. And uh, again, uh, what we have to do when recording an audio signal is make sure that the signal is band limited and then choose the right sampling rate. And uh, this is exactly what has been done for CD audio recordings. And uh, so this is something you might want to keep.